there was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, you know it, she was very, very good. But when she was bad, she was horrid. Well, I have naturally curly hair. I wonder whether my mother forced that curl right to the middle so this palm would stick to me. Because during childhood, my parents used that palm as a disciplinary tool, especially when my behavior was deemed horrid. Yet nothing in that poem prepared me for the wisdom which every social change agent must learn. That even if, or especially when, one is very, very good, cries of denunciation, horrid, horrid, could be equally as loud as cries of appreciation. Hmm, good, good. I am a theologian. To speak openly as a theologian, especially now as religion becomes malignantly yoked with violence and ignorance, is to invite projections and misperceptions through which I do not always choose to wade. So, uh, huh, you're a theologian, mumbled my seatmate on the flight from Toronto to Vancouver. Can you help me keep the plane in the air? No, sorry, I don't keep planes in the air. Nor do I receive, as you can plainly see, any more of a guarantee of immunity from life than the rest of you. Religions can be described as practices for cultivating a taste for life. It takes practice to learn to love life and to entrust ourselves to it without cynicism or despair. A theologian, something of a philosopher conjoined to a poet, thinks between science's best picture of the world and cultural politics, and alongside the evolving tracks of a religious tradition. Theologians use poetry to stimulate the human imagination towards living with reverence for the infinite mysteries we can never fully grasp. Theologians, like that toddler relentlessly asking, why, but, but why, will we probe the big questions of life? How do you stay in love with a world that dishes to the body, well, the indignities of aging, for one thing, how does one develop the soulful resilience to aspire to love one's enemies and to search for justice when such commitments don't really seem to pay off in a lifetime? How do we release our fears long enough to take a good, welcoming look at each other? As a feminist theologian, I work critically on the traditions of Christianity and the power lines of Western culture, sussing out where and how each circulates the privileges of power that favor certain lives while avoiding appreciation of the lives of women. I work constructively, that is philosophically, poetically, to generate alternative metaphors which scattered like seeds or picked up like song lines in the brain might swerve culture towards an appreciation of mortal life and living well with the earth. The term body so important to our sense of self today, gives us one example of how theology has effectively generated alternative cultural value. Amidst the ancient Roman Empire, body was then, as distinct from now, a strictly derogatory term. Derogatory. A slave was but a body. Christian theology pushed back on the Roman Empire, insisting on the sacred worth of all bodies since God had become, Christianity claimed, flesh. Now, 
we women have had in recent decades to push on Christianity itself, given its historic squandering of our specifically female flesh. So today we still must ply, as Dove Soap puts it, the campaign for real beauty. And let me then add my own little addendum to learning to recognize real beauty when you see it. Now, you can imagine then, with that little history lesson in mind, that when I assume to wear this, what is called a Roman collar, and which designates me as a Christian clergy, when the tradition has historically peddled a picture of women as something more like this, women's sex as the devil's gateway, the cries from the sideline will be a mixed sigh of relief, oh, thank God. And at the same time, because it unsettles ingrained assumptions, horrid, horrid. So, how does a girl raised in subsistence agriculture aspire to be a feminist theologian? Having a maternal grandmother who taught Sunday school for 50 years and going to eight years of parochial elementary school makes the aspiration hardly unlikely. But my own theological disposition was more decisively shaped by the Christian naturalism of my father. Determinedly engaged in subsistence farming, just as cash crop Farm agriculture emerged, dad refused to clear cut stands of black walnut trees on our 80 acres of pasture, despite how much we needed that cash. At the first thaw, when dad headed to the woods to harvest timber for fence posts, the emergence of the first hairy wood crocus would bring him home misty-eyed like a large mitted flower girl riding on his orange Alice Chalmers tractor. And when the gypsies arrived for the annual whitewashing of the cow barn, they were always seated with us for family dinner forcing each of us kids to recognize that even we, the poor among the farming community, carried our own prejudices against others affiliated with dirt and poverty. Hospitality was nonetheless, Dad insisted, the rule of the table as it was of the land. Because I was a very good student, the college faculty of religion, still all male in the late 1970s, called me into the office of the departmental chair. They, the seven of them, spoke like a chorus. We want you to dream bigger dreams. Become a pastor. My parents, appalled at the way I overstepped gender roles in assuming to be ordained, were incensed. They resolved out of their own felt religious responsibility to silence me by keeping me from graduating from college. A wheat farmer from South Dakota became my patron through my first master's degree. His only stipulation that I respect the anonymity of his gift and never try to find him. Feminism, you will note, did not follow gender lines. I am entering now the encore years of my career, working as an independent scholar, researching, writing, and giving occasional lectures across the continent, from Harvard and Boston University to Vanderbilt in Nashville and the GTU in Berkeley. I've had two prior career iterations the first as an ordained clergy in the Lutheran tradition of Christianity, the second as a professor of theology. As the first woman pastor wherever I went, people didn't just wag their tongues. They mounted character assassination. They nattered about the ways in which my earrings move like fish lures, 
They complained that my shoes striking the floor just didn't have that air of authority. I seemed too young, my voice not the right pitch. They gossiped that the adoption of my daughter proved my heterosexual marriage was a sham, that I was a lesbian, as every feminist surely must be. If I have no issue with also shouldering the queer agenda, as I have politically and philosophically, living on the front lines of social change is exhausting, especially when the denunciations are so personally, bodily insidious. I vowed to raise my daughter somewhere other than the site of such intimate conflict, and so entered the life of the teaching academy. As a professor, I have had the pleasure of watching new ideas recircuit human lives. Ideas are that of which revolutions, including social as well as personal change, are born. And there is nothing more thrilling than watching an idea rush through a body like the flush of a blood transfusion. Yet, in aspiring to the academy, I overestimated the sheltering power of today's version of academic freedom. That childhood poem seemed to insinuate, and I have believed that if I worked hard enough and became very, very good, the quality of my work would, when recognized, carry me. Just as I was about to relax into the maturity of my scholarship, I hit yet again that malevolent undertow that wants to silence perturbing intellectual questions and, in my view, to retreat from how what we have grown to know of the world reshapes the work of religion itself. Further, as women academics, we're still held to the standards of nurture rather than intellectual rigor. Silencing is more obvious when traceable to papal authorities or to militant forces like Boko Haram opposed to the education of women. But do not doubt that feminists on this continent, whether journalists, educators, politicians, or theologians, still face forces that would hush us up. This scouring of intellectual integrity like that which happens when state legislatures dampen curriculum on climate change in the name of economics? If also, yes, as religious institutions succumb to control of their ideological spectrums by their donors, that silencing should worry us all in the face of our need for honest human discourse given the perils of our future. When shouldering social change, neither the safety net of a tenured career nor academic freedom necessarily promise a secure location from which to work, sometimes especially as we become very good at what we do. I'd like to be a romantic, insisting that progress is inevitable but glass ceilings still claim their toll and tongues still wag about a woman's horrid pretensions. Then again, any social change agent must know that it is our collective work over generations that yields what we still might authentically call cultural progress. Wait. I bet you thought, as people often do, that I was going to talk about it. That great donut hole of my limb loss. By not taking you down the rabbit hole, I've tried to suggest that the work of living through trauma is precisely that, to live. Trauma need not swallow the entirety of a lifetime Cripped and crumped, we can resolve to turn our face to life, to savor it yet again. 
honestly, if you've developed a taste for life, you will be far more resilient than you think you are. Twisted and torqued, dinged and ditched, one may still or finally be able to get a taste of life's marrow. Sweet, I say, so sweet. <laughs>